and a very warm welcome to this our online service at St Mary's Wootton on Trinity Sunday. Greetings in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. My name is Philip Young and I'm the curate here. If you haven't seen me for a few weeks that's because I've been on placement at the King's Arms Project. Uh, later on we'll get a chance to look at some of the work they do uh, supporting the homeless, uh, the vulnerable, uh, refugees and others. A few weeks ago we began a new sermon series looking at some of the issues of the day. Uh, a few weeks ago we looked at uh, abuse in the church and today we're going to look at the issue of racial justice which has taken on an added dimension in the light of George Floyd's death a year ago and the subsequent rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. We're trying to get some timeless wisdom uh, from the scriptures to bring to bear, to help us to navigate some of these issues in a distinctly Christian way. Today is also uh, Trinity Sunday, as I said, and so I'm going to open with the collect for Trinity Sunday. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us your servants by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of divine majesty to worship the unity Keep us steadfast in this faith, that we may evermore be defended from all adversities through King Jesus, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We're going to begin our, uh, with our opening hymn, which declares the glories of our triune God. Holy, holy, holy. just sung of God's awesome holiness and that is one thing that separates him the creator from us his creation only he is holy the apostle John writes in his first letter 
that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. But, lest we be overwhelmed, he goes on to say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At King's Arms Project, we believe there's no such thing as a hopeless case. No one is too entrenched in poverty of any kind that they're beyond hope. Over the last 30 years, we've seen people overcome incredible adversity and go on to achieve amazing personal success. We refuse to give up on anybody.
We believe that people belong in community. No one should have to face homelessness alone. We believe that wider society is part of the solution. It's about compassion and relationships, helping to build community through all our services. Our outreach workers engage with clients on the streets, assessing how best to help them out of poverty and into safe accommodation. Our direct access night shelter is open every single night of the year. Through all the changes the world has seen over the last 30 years, we've been there whenever people need us. We believe that people deserve opportunity, that everyone deserves the chance to try and advance themselves to see dreams realised. Our work is about more than helping people into houses or flats. It's about helping people to become everything they've been created to be. Through our Pathways to Employment courses, we see people break out of poverty and develop in every area of their lives. We've seen clients go on to become social pioneers and community leaders. We believe in the people we work with and we love being part of their story. We believe that God is good. Our Christian identity underpins everything that we do. God has great plans for people's lives, including the poor, vulnerable and forgotten. We believe there's no such thing as a hopeless case and we'll be here for as long as it takes to end homelessness. I hope you enjoyed that overview of the King's Arms project. I spent the last two weeks there um, working with the team, going out on the streets, uh, trying to find people who are rough sleeping, homeless, um, and trying to get alongside them, help them to find some uh, more permanent uh, accommodation. Um, I spent time in ESOL classes with Syrian refugees. Uh, I went to their Pathways to Employment life coaching sessions and I was able to see how they equip and encourage their staff in the work that they do. It was really eye-opening. I heard some wonderful stories of positive change and met some really excellent people. If you'd like to know more about the project, uh, please do speak to me, or probably even better still, Peter or Angela Stevens, who have a long-standing uh, relationship with the night shelter within the project. We will begin and end our prayers with some words from Psalm 16. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Father, thank you that you are always with us and that you promise to never leave us. Thank you that even when we are feeling overwhelmed, sad or anxious, that we shall not be shaken because of your all-sustaining grace in the Lord Jesus. Sovereign God, we pray for there to be an end to the ongoing pandemic, which continues to affect us in so many ways. We continue to pray for India. Thank you that their number of cases have started to fall. As they begin to recover, we pray for those who are devastated by grief. We also pray for the situation in Bedford as cases remain high. We pray that these cases would start to drop as more people are vaccinated. In the meantime, please help us to act lovingly and thoughtfully by showing others that we care for their safety, while also reaching out to support one another as much as we can during this time. Amen. Lord of all, as we pray for Bedford, we thank you for the work of the King's Arms Project and particularly for the time that Philip Young has spent with them on placement. We pray that you would continue to work through the King's Arms Project to bring hope and healing to individuals in desperate need. We pray that you would continue to give the resources that they need and that those who are struggling would be made aware of the practical and spiritual help that is available through them. We ask that through this project, many would come to a living faith in the Lord Jesus and that your name would be glorified. Amen. 
Loving Father, we pray for those we know personally who are battling with the storms of life at the moment. As we spend a moment in silence, we bring to you in our hearts those who are in need of your love and peace at this time. Amen. Finally, Lord, we bring you our personal troubles before you as we close with the final words of Psalm 16. You have made known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Amen. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Christians have had a variety of ways of expressing that faith in the triune God. One of those is by a creed, a statement of belief. And we're now going to affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, 
and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Revelation 7, verses 1 to 12. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing round the throne and round the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom, and thanks, and honour, and power, and strength be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd open our eyes that we would see wonderful things, healing things, glorious things in your word today. Amen. Mum, why did they kill that guy? Mum, why did they kill that guy? Question from an 11 year old child of BBC presenter Eddie Nestor. After the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis a year ago this week. And his mother Lisa said in a short film on the BBC website this week, that was the moment I realized I had to tell Kai about the color of his skin you realise you've got to have a conversation with them that because of the colour of the skin, things may well be different for them. And it's really hard. The murder of George Floyd by a police officer in Minneapolis uh, last year has been a turning point for our world. Uh, ethnic minorities around the world are rising up and saying, enough is enough, this is our Me Too moment. Uh, and for millions of families, um, it's made us realise that racial justice is never far away for, for them. And that something is badly wrong in a world where that is so. Um, where families live with that fear, as I don't. Uh, our family has enjoyed a life of, of white privilege. And so I'm massively disadvantaged in speaking about this. But speak and talk about it, we must. This is the second of three series about 
demanding issues facing the world and Christians. A couple of weeks ago, abuse, today, race, next week, gender. And um, like all these issues, they are both complex and simple. Um, as we try to ask, what does following Jesus, what does uh, believing what the Bible has to say uh, mean in this area? And I want to suggest it gives us at the outset two stars, if you like, to steer by, justice and creation. Justice, you might say, is giving people their due, giving people what is owed to them, treating people as they are in God's sight. Read through the Bible, God is committed to a, a rich concept of justice. Psalm 11, for the Lord is righteous, he loves justice. And that's more than the crime and punishment justice of the courtroom. It's a justice that always takes the side of the vulnerable, the marginalised, the fatherless, the orphan, the Samaritan, the oppressed, the exploited, the powerless. That gives people what is owed to them, whether that is punishment or protection and care, provision and fair treatment. We hear about it in the prophets. What does the Lord require of you, says Micah, to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly? with your God. What does Jesus say? Many things, including this. Woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, your rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs. You're scrupulously righteous in one way, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. That's the first principle, the justice that God loves that we bring to these, these issues. The second is the humanity that God creates. No better place to go than the first chapter of the Bible. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his image. Tells us what we are as human beings, what we are made to be, created in the image of God. Not some more in the image of God than others, not gender identical, male and female, he created them. Not ethnically identical. Read Acts chapter 17. We hear, from one man God made all nations that they should inhabit the earth. Not identical, but all equal in God's sight. All in the image, all made for relationship with God, all made to walk with God. In this book, his testimony is my heritage women of colour on the word of God. One of the um, contributors, uh, Natasha Robinson from Alabama, says this, the word of God gives me confidence in the face of what culture and other people say that I am. The truth that I am made by God and I belong to him gives me confidence to stand known, loved, valued and unafraid. God's hands have made me and that is good news to my soul. Human beings have equal dignity, worth and value because we're made in the image of God. So where does that take Christians? Justice, creation, where does that take us as we address this issue? There's no shortage of voices, is there? All over the airwaves and in print, reports and campaigns and websites and conferences. I was on an online conference on Tuesday evening, the anniversary of George Floyd's uh, murder. And we need to hear those voices. This sermon is the beginning, not the end. We'll need to talk about these issues one-to-one -one, in groups, in growth groups, with our young people. And the voice we need to hear above all those voices is the one of the one who cares about justice for everyone made in his image and who has promised to bring it to pass. And that means Christians do have a way through to deal with this well and kindly and justly and honestly. Let me suggest there are four tasks among those that Christians, the scripture sets before us on this issue. Four distinctive tasks for the Christian. The first is that there is a past to lament, uh, a past and a present to lament and to repent. We no longer live in a Genesis 1 world. We live in a Genesis 3 world, a world that is broken, a world where there's suffering and division and fear and exploitation and injustice. And so the Bible doesn't pretend that all is well. In fact, it's full of words of lament for the injustice, the wrong, 
the suffering of people at the hands of the prejudiced and privileged. Psalm 10, why Lord do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In his arrogance, the, the wicked man hunts down the weak. He boasts about the cravings of his heart. He says to himself, nothing will shake me. The Bible cries out about injustice and Jesus was deeply moved by it, broke down in tears at the uh, suffering caused by the death of his friend Lazarus, for example. Now, for anyone in the West, there is a past and a present to lament when it comes to racial injustice. For 200 years, people in this country encouraged and funded and defended the transatlantic slave trade, which brought turmoil and devastation across vast parts of Africa and generations of dehumanizing, brutal treatment for slaves and their descendants across America, the West Indies, and many other places, while enriching British companies, British families, British communities, British colleges and schools, and all too often the church stood by and even actively supported it. Read books like Home Going by Yagi Arsi to get a sense of what that has meant for generations of people from Africa and lament. And yes, many Christians were in the forefront eventually of bringing slavery to an end where, where they could, but we live with the legacy of the, all that damage. And it's about far more than monuments and statues. It's about family histories of millions of people, including many whose parents and grandparents have chosen to make their home in this country. He would say to us, we are here because you were there. And there's a present, so there's a past to lament, and there's a present to lament, and many dimensions to that. We've heard the injustices of, of the Windrus generation. We hear the day-to-day -day experiences of ethnic minorities in this country. Even today, at this conference on Tuesday night, I heard that people, people with uh, black skin are, on average, in the cities of our country, eight times more likely to be stopped and searched by the police. A black pastor from London, on another film uh, tells us that um, I've been stopped more times than I can remember. When I see a policeman today, I don't think safety, I think fear. And whatever progress there's been made, there's more to be done. And for most of us, of course, this, there's a personal dimension. Things I've said and thought things I should have said and did not say, things I'll need to hear which will be difficult to hear. There's a past and a present to lament and to repent, to change. A society that needs changing, church that needs changing, minds that need changing. Change that resolves in the first place to listen, to take the time to listen before we speak. And then change in our thinking and change in our behaviour that brings reconciliation. And Christians know that change is possible. We know we've been treated with generosity and grace by um, God, with a justice that comes from him through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus, who accepts us when we turn back to him and sets us free to make a fresh start. Second thing, there is a church, therefore, to be renewed. What did you hear in that reading? What did John, the author of Revelation, hear and see in that great vision? Well, he heard a number. As he listened, he heard a number announced, 144,000. It's a number that stands for the whole people of God. One people. It sounds like, initially, a racial people, one race, one ethnicity, the 12 tribes of Israel. Until we hear what he sees, what he sees that that one people is made up of a great multitude that no one can count from every nation tribe people and language standing before the throne and before the lamb he sees that this people the people for whom the lord the lamb died the church is from every nation includes people of every language and tribe and culture that jesus died to unite people in himself from all the nations. So there's a unity in the church, which is a unity in diversity. 
a unity across cultures which doesn't erase cultures. There they will be. Every language and tribe and nation. Since the cross and resurrection, a new world has broken in on the Genesis 3 world and it's the church. And that means that there's a church to be renewed. Uh, within a couple of months of the resurrection, Jesus through his spirit was calling this people into being from all nations. They were there, they were there on the day of Pentecost. And if you read through Acts, uh, the gospel goes to all nations, to an Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 and to many more. Wherever the gospel went, as people came to Christ from different ethnic backgrounds, different cultures, the cultural and racial barriers between them came crashing down. And the multi-ethnic, multicultural people of God came into being. And those barriers are still coming down whenever people come to Christ. But that's not always reflected in every church. You'll know the story of how the Windrush generation Christians coming to the West, from the West Indies in, in, 19, in the 1950s were often turned away from Church of England churches. And we are horrified to hear that. But where are the barriers today? Perhaps more subtle. How off-putting is the way we do things to Christian believers from minority ethnic backgrounds, from different cultures? It's about our the faces and accents at the front and leading grad It all sends a message. We need to ask the question, because it won't be like that in eternity. In eternity, we'll see that unity in diversity perfect, perfectly. And if we can be more of a Revelation 7 church now, today, what should that take? And we can have those conversations, hear each other's stories, talk together about them, because, because when we think about it, we know my identity, your identity, is not in the first place white, British, or whatever label or tick box you fill in on a form at the doctor's or at a vaccination centre or wherever you fill in a form these days. Our identity as Christians is not our culture in the first place, but we belong to Jesus Christ. We all belong to Jesus Christ. Saved, forgiven, reconciled, heading for an eternity with him. And we can set forth on this journey of renewal in hope and confidence because of that. Church to be renewed, vision to be pursued, a vision not just in the church, but for society. There's a biblical voice to be heard, many voices being heard, many frustration, frustrated voices being heard today on this issue. And we can make common cause with many people in contending for equal treatment of all people across society, in education, the justice system and employment, on the basis of our common humanity, all made in the image of God. We can make common cause because many secular ideas of justice, though they may not be identical with Christian notions, are rest on biblical foundations. So we will find common ground and be able to collaborate. We may not agree with all the objectives of the Black Lives Matter movement, but let's not be silent about saying Black Lives Matter to Jesus and to us. Let's be in the forefront where we can be in combating discrimination and prejudice against people made in God's image. And the church has a big role to play in that. Because the church is the visible sign today of the reconciling, barrier-dissolving, barrier multicultural diversity of the people of God, of the Revelation 7 people of God, of what humanity was made to be and one day in Christ will be restored to be. And anybody who comes through a church door should begin to get a whiff, a foretaste of that multi-ethnic, multicultural unity. People who accept each other and love each other. There are one people in lament for the past, one people seeking humbly to repent of what is wrong, one people who in our forgiven brokenness know that we are loved by God and set free to glorify him in this life. There's a vision to be pursued and then of course there is a love to be trusted. <clears throat> Christy Anya Wabile is another, con another contributor to this book. Um, in her chapter, which is called Raising Black Boys with Hope, she reflects on the fear 
that she feels in America, bringing up her children as a Christian in a Genesis 3 world where justice is slow to come and is far from certain, but where the victory of Jesus is breaking in and where Revelation 7 is a reality and where we are therefore waiting, always waiting. And she calls attention to a couple of verses from Psalm 119. Let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise. Let your mercy come to me for your law is my delight. And Christian Uvili comments, God promises to console us in our pains and afflictions and sorrows with reminders of his steadfast love, which never ceases and which even death cannot extinguish. When I am fearful about the world preying on my son or fearful that he will be tragically misunderstood, I remember the love of God. I lay my anxieties and fears at his feet and in his tender mercy, he comforts me. There is a Lord who we can trust when things are wrong. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. And that must be part of our posture towards this issue. We belong to the one who has overcome. In him, we will overcome. And through him, we can therefore persevere in seeking justice, biblical justice for people in a broken world. We can listen humbly. We can bear each other's burdens sacrificially. We can contend for justice and be patient as we wait for it to, to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, with the angels of heaven in Revelation 7, we praise you for the wonder of your saving purpose, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth in under Christ through the achievement of his blood and as we grieve for the brokenness and pain of this world we ask you would create and sustain in us the patience to listen the compassion to care the courage to speak the heart to change and the hope of reconciliation and justice which your love will secure in Jesus name Amen I just start from the beginning. I've been stopped by the police more times than I can remember. You know, the only black people I ever saw growing up, they were people who had come from the closest township to work. I've been stopped not only when I was younger, but even on the way to preach sermons. The images that we have of them depict them mm. as white Europeans. Mm. Mm. Yeah in the same way that Jesus was clearly a white English. <laughs> I feel in the wake of the George Floyd stuff that a lot of black people like me have been able to say this is my story too. When I see a policeman today, um, I don't think safety. I tend to think fear. Paul speaking in Athens and he says, from one man, God made all the nations. And so there's that unity that all of us are the same beginning. If I were to ask churches up and down the country to consider one question, it would be, why should we celebrate ethnicity according to the teachings of the Bible? You're the word of God, the Father.
As the general public health situation in our country regarding COVID-19 improves, I wanted to invite you to join us again on Sunday mornings here in the church building at 10 o'clock. Christians from the earliest days have had a habit of meeting together to catch up with one another and to encourage one another in our walk with the Lord. Please do consider coming again to our in-person service you can book for those services by following the links online. At 11.30 today, as usual, we'll have Zoom coffee. Please do come, catch up with one another, hear how we can support and pray for one another. Links on the bulletin and online on the website. But for now, let's close our time together with the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.